Hello, this is Mike again from Scratch, and welcome to a brand new tutorial series. Today we're going to be looking at a new game engine called Godot. Uh, it's actually not new, it just hit its 1.0 release, however. Uh, Godot is an open-source, C++-based, cross-platform, Unity-esque 2D and 3D game engine. Uh, it works on Windows, Linux, and Mac, and it can target all those platforms, plus iOS, Android, uh, Windows Phone's coming soon, HTML5 is coming soon, as well as, I do believe, BlackBerry. Uh, if you're interested in it, I actually did a pretty in-depth overview view of what the Godot engine is, uh, I'll provide it the comments link below. Uh, it's also, like I said, the beginning of a brand new tutorial series, and we're going to hopefully over time cover all aspects of Godot development. Um, there will be a table of contents links at the bottom, being that this is the very first actual tutorial, and not a very big table of contents yet, but bear with me and we will fill it out. Uh, today itself, we're going to jump right into Godot, uh, look at creating our first simple application. Of course, since this is a tutorial, and in the first tutorial, we are, of course, going to start with Hello World. And we're going to make ours a little bit more interesting than that, but it will show you uh, the basics of how a Godot program works, uh, how to navigate the UI, how to go ahead and get it, etc. Uh, for every tutorial in this series, I'm actually going to do a corresponding text tutorial, as long as it makes sense. So there will be a text tutorial and a video tutorial for every single stage. So if you prefer text, uh, you can go to GameFromScratch.com and see it there. Uh, you can see right here in the background, this is actually, I've already published the text version. I'm doing the video after the fact in this case. Anyway, it's a fairly in-depth, a lot of screenshots. You can figure out where you need to go. Okay, I went a little too far. Uh, but if you go to Game From Scratch, again, the link will be in the bottom to the actual corresponding text tutorial to go along with it. We'll cover more or less the same materials. Uh, I tend to blabber a bit more during the video, so you'll have a bit more um, probably detail in the video version. Uh, but sometimes it's easier to follow along or for reference to use a text version. So that's why I'm providing both. So anyways, let's jump right in with Godot. Uh, so it's open source, it's completely free, so let's go ahead and download it. It's pretty impressive, it's a very self-contained package. You just come in, you pick your platform. Uh, in this case, I'm on 64-bit uh, Windows, so I'm just going to download that executable here. And there we go, download it. Uh, while we're still on this page, I want to point out a couple things. They also have a uh, Kalata exporter for doing 3D models. We'll touch on that much, much later down in the series. Uh, exporting templates as well for uh, sending them to various platforms. We'll talk about that later as well. But the thing that you should really be aware of here is the Godot demos. Uh, there's a lot of demos included with this. One thing that kind of is the, the negative point for the Godot engine, and part of the reason why I'm doing this tutorial series, is the uh, help material isn't great. Uh, there's not a ton of it. Uh, the getting started stuff isn't incredible, but there is a lot of demonstration stuff, including uh, arts and assets to work with. Uh, so when you're just getting started, you know, beyond this tutorial series, of course, uh, if you want to get a little bit more in depth or try to figure things out yourself, grab these demos and definitely take a look. All right, so anyways, now it's been downloaded. Let's go ahead and just load it up. The nice thing is there's no installer, there's nothing. The Godot uh, program is also a project manager. And when you open it and create it, boom, here is your starting screen. Uh, so again, no installation, just bring it down and run it. So you can run this from a USB drive if you want, kind of handy that way. Uh, the UI is consistent across uh, all different platforms, which has advantages and disadvantages. It's not a native UI, uh, but the behavior is consistent across Mac, Windows, Linux. So uh, a bit of an up, bit of a down. Well, here you come to your, your basic project manager, and here, first off, if you download these uh, that zip file with all the, uh, the demo projects, you're going to import them right here. But what we want to do is actually go ahead and create a new project. So just click New here, and you got to pick a path, a place to save the project. I'll go ahead and make it here. I'll create a folder called Do Demo, like so, and everything's going to be in that folder itself. Let's go ahead and open that. So the project name comes automatically from the directory. And then when you're ready, just click Create. Uh, so this is now I've made your project. Now next time you load this up, all your projects will be um, tallied and displayed right here. Ditto as you start importing demos. Uh, they'll all show up in a list here. So once you're ready, you can either just uh, double left click on this guy right here, or single click, and then click Edit. And welcome to the Godot interface. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail how this works. If you want more of an overview of, of the, uh, the IDE itself, uh, take that uh, uh, walkthrough video I did earlier. You'll get a lot more detail or depth into what's included. But this is the basic Godot interface. This is where you will more or less live from now on. Uh, right now we're in 3D mode. These important, these taps right here are important for uh, switching between your different modes. So your 2D editing, this is where you actually draw your world. Uh, 3D, same thing if you're working in 3D. Script, here's where you'll be editing your scripts. We'll come back to that. And here is where your help is available. Uh, if you've used Unity, this should all look very familiar. Uh, there might be a little bit of plagiarism going on. Um, up here you got your, uh, your control buttons, your play, your stop, your resume, open. Uh, 
and then your scene and resource navigation here, resources, your files, etc. cetera. Uh, Inspector is basically property viewer. Um, so let's go ahead and now that we've got the scene going, let's get things started. At the core of um, the Godot uh, model or hierarchy is the node. You basically assemble your scene out of a hierarchy of nodes. So let's go ahead and create one right away. Like I said, we're going to make a Hello World application. So we're going to start with a text node. Uh, in this case, it's called a rich text label. So what you do is you create a new node over here in the scene. So you tab between them here, but we want the scene selected. And you click here for a new uh, node. And then we want rich text label. As you can see, there are lots of nodes built in. And you can easily create one yourself uh, using either GDScript, which is a Python S script, or C++. Uh, it's your choice. We'll, we'll cover C++ later on down the road. Uh, but you can extend out of Node and add things to here like Mad. But let's just go ahead and add our rich text label, this guy we want. So at the top, as you see, you can filter uh, by wildcard up here. And just pick rich text label and create. So over here, you see this is your world. This is your cutoff, um, your screen dimensions by default. And this is the node you just created. You can left click to drag it around, or you can grab control handles to resize it. Now what you'll see down here is there's this inspector view. This is what looks at all the configurable properties of that node. Um, Godot takes a somewhat component-based look. Uh, so a node is made up of an anchor, a margin, a rect, uh, inherited from the control, it's inherited from canvas item which has a visibility, it's inherited from node. So these are the different classes that um, this is the, basically the inheritance tree that the rich text label inherits from. So pretty much uh, canvas item inherited from node and control inherited from canvas item. And you can come through and change all of the various properties that are exposed. Uh, so instead of changing and resizing here, you can also set the values here or as you see as I'm editing here, the values are changing in the bottom right. So you can, you can set your properties in the inspector or you can set them over here. One thing to be aware of right off the hop though, and this is kind of annoying and hopefully it's something they fix, but if I come in here and do say 222, okay, it hasn't committed yet. So if I tab away, it doesn't set. So if you manually edit a property, make sure you hit the enter key so that it commits. But basically that is adding a text-based, um, our rich text label node to our game world. Let's put it back to the origin. And now we need to add some text to it. Oddly enough, the text property of this is not exposed. So we need to hook a script up to it. Script, you just basically collect the, select the node you want here. And I'll show you one thing quick, is you can actually edit in. So like I can get, instead of that, I can come down here and say, um, my rich text label and change the name of the, the node within your scene. But now that we've got our node selected, we come up here and you hit this little guy right here, which is your script configuration. And this is going to create a new script or open the existing script, depending if there is one. There isn't one in this case, so this is bringing up the new script dialog. Um, it's going to automatically inherit the class that it is and brings up the language to write it in. Um, Godot is written to support multiple languages, but there is only one language TD script that has been implemented. So perhaps down the road, there could be a Lua or C Sharp, etc. in your language selection. Uh, but in this case right now, there is just GD script. Uh, then the final thing you've got to do is create a path for it. Uh, one thing to be aware of, and I'll show you right here when I create this new path, all of the resources are relative to your root directory. Uh, so anything you want in the file system, any art, etc., you need to bring them into that folder you created originally. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, put it. How did I do it in the text? Uh, I'm not sure. I'll show you this way anyway. So, so we'll go ahead and we'll create a folder. This is completely optional. You don't have to. Uh, but if you want to organize things a little bit more, you can. So I'm going to create the scripts folder like so. And then um, we'll call this guy my script. Uh, .gd. Now it's important, you have to add this .gd extension, unfortunately, uh, it won't add it automatically. It'll just throw an error at you if you don't do that. Uh, so there we go, we've defined our script, uh, we've put the location in and we've named it. So now let's save it and then create it. So there is our script. This is GD script and right off the hop, one thing you should be aware of with Godot is there is a built-in uh, editing, uh, a code editor built right into it that's also got debugging, breakpoint support, etc. Uh, very handy. Nice thing is there's also code completion. Now the flip side is Godot uses its own custom programming language, which is, as I said earlier, a Python-like 
uh, language. It's very simple to learn. That's the key thing to pretty much every single uh, successful scripting language is it should be simple to learn. And for the most part, if you've ever used Python at all, it will immediately make sense. If not, go to the uh, the text version of this tutorial, and I've linked in some resources, uh, mostly wiki entries, etc., from the um, Godot website. But you can learn a bit more in the language there. The one thing to be aware of, especially if you come from C++, Java, C Sharp, or say JavaScript background, you're used to curly braces denoting scope, or semicolons denoting line termination. That is not the case in Python-like languages. New lines determined where things end. So as you see, this function actually the semicolon and then the tabbing indent is what controls the scope of it. So every time you, uh, like if you have an if, you tab in the next line. And then when you move out of that scope, you untab it. So the, uh, the scope or the local, um, the local scope is set by uh, the tabbing and indentation. And it takes a bit to get used to, but it does have some upsides. It makes code, uh, makes tricky code, like for example, this line of C++ code, uh, let me try and type better. I can't type today. Which we've probably all typed at least once if you've worked in C++. This is impossible. And if you haven't noticed, this is actually a bug. What will happen here is you will have a for loop that loops 10 times doing nothing because you accidentally put this at the end of the line. So even if it looks like it's scoped down here, it isn't because you've got the terminator up here. So what this does is creates a new local scope which does absolutely nothing of value. Uh, this is the kind of thing that white space based uh, scripting languages try to get away from. If it's good or bad, totally up to you. I can see the advantages, I can see the disadvantages. However, when working with Godot, the primary scripting language took this approach, so learn to live with it. <laughs> uh, here we go. I'll get back to the past later on. Uh, it's a form of multitasking. We'll, we'll touch on it a bit later, but for right now, we're just going to go ahead and delete that. So here's our function ready. Ready is called, ready is not a constructor. Uh, it's actually called after the control itself, you know, after the node itself is created and good to go. If you want a constructor-like behavior, that is, you want it to be the guaranteed first call, you use a function called underscore init. Uh, you'll notice all of these are actually inherited from when I said earlier about those different, those three classes that made up this guy, uh, node, uh, canvas item, etc., these actually come from either node or the base object class, uh, these underscore overridable functions. But the ready one is called after it's been created and it is coincidentally ready to go. So, first thing we need to do is self is the equivalent of this. So, self dot uh, add, why am I not getting code completion? like so. And let's go ahead and that should be it. So that will unload when this control is ready, uh, set its text to hello world. Now the next key thing we've got to do is save our scene. Uh, I'll put it in the root folder this time. We'll keep it with the default name of new underscore scene. Once again, you have to give the extension or this will error out and go ahead and save it. So now our scene has been saved. We need to set it as the startup scene. That is done by going up here to the scene menu and going to project settings. And then locate main scene, this guy right here, and go over here to the open, and go file, and then just pick the scene you just created. All right, so that's it. You'll notice in here also, there's a number of properties for your application. So as I said earlier, the editing window, the 2D, that frame was 800 by 600 is defined here uh, the driver set here the uh, if it's resizable etc so a lot of your application specific settings are set uh, in this settings folder and there's other stuff up here for like localization and input mapping we'll touch on all of that later on uh, so for now let's just go into the general go to your main scene setting and set it to the scene you just created and now that you're done click close all right so in theory this should add so called add text on hello world. So let's go ahead and run that. And there you go. You can't see it very well, but there is our text set when we run. Now, one thing you might notice is that text was pretty damn small. So when you're setting text in um, Godot, you actually need to create a font per size. So we want to make a slightly bigger uh, text available or different color. Or it's, um, no, not color, sorry, but different uh, font format or family. You need to import it. Fortunately, it's a fairly simple thing to do. So let's uh, let's change out the uh, let's change out the font on our uh, our guy here. First off, let's switch over, select it, 
it's selected. All right. Now let's go over here to import and font. Now what you can do is you can bring in a true type font uh, from your system and set it up however you want. You can see the preview right here of what we're going to create. So we'll just go ahead and uh, load in a font. I'm going to use the ones available from uh, Windows itself. So uh, they're back here. Keep in mind, uh, all fonts are actually uh, licensed or trademarked. Uh, you can't just use one, even though people do it all the time. Uh, there is a copyright. People do license these fonts out to use them. There are thousands of free and open source ones available online. Uh, just be aware that you can't distribute a product using a font if you don't have a license for it, like what I'm about to do. Uh, so I could not distribute this application legally uh, because I don't have a license to the particular font. But if you're using Windows under the Windows slash fonts folder, all of your system fonts are registered there. So I'm going to go in here and grab the comic book font. And that's under predictable enough C. Uh, so comic here, there's, there's the italics form, etc. So comic.ttf and just go ahead and open it. So now you can see the previews updated a bit here. Now what I want to do is I want to change the font size a bit. Like so there we go. All right, why are you being so slow? Uh, that's part of why. All right. So finally, you just have to save it somewhere. Um, we could put it, and eh, we will. Let's be clean. Make a fonts folder, and we will call it my comic font. Right. Once again, need the extension, .fnt, and click OK. So that will create a, uh, let's go with 30, nice rounded number, 30 point font size version of comic into that file of uh, my comic font in the fonts folder. Uh, there's other settings you can do here for it. Uh, change the spacing, um, change the color, etc. Uh, in this case, I'll just go ahead with that guy and import it. All right, so we have now added a font into our system. You can go over here to the file system and browse the hierarchy that we're creating as we go. Uh, we'll just go on back to the inspector with our guy selected, which coincidentally, you can also select things using the scene. Uh, panel over here. So now that it's picked, uh, let's head on down and find the uh, font section, custom font. And we're going to change it from null to loading and select our font like so. So now when I go ahead and run it, there we go. Much nicer text, bigger, and there's our first application. Now let's change it up a bit. We're going to actually make it so that our application does something. And I'm also going to illustrate how nodes work. You can use nodes to do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. There's a lot in there out of the box. We saw that earlier on. Uh, let's close that down and I will show you that quickly again. This is really irritating, by the way. I wish they get rid of that OK message. But all right, so with my, uh, my node select, I'm actually going to add a child node to this one. So with it selected, just go ahead and hit the new again. And let's get rid of our search filter here. And what we want now, I'm going to show you here, a lot of this is for UI, right? so split controllers, buttons, scrolling, etc. But what we want is a timer. So come on down here and pick out timer. Timer and then create. So we've just added a timer node uh, to our rich text node. And the timer has these properties you can see down here. And the key thing we want to do is say auto start is on. That means as soon as that thing is loaded and ready, it will start the timer counting. Uh, the wait time up here is one second. So every one second, it is going to uh, so automatically start. Every one second, it's going to do something. Uh, now, the something part is key. Uh, there's an event system in uh, Godot, which we're about to take advantage of. A lot of times, you would use it for um, UI controls, things like uh, a button was pressed or etc. So if you've done any WinForm win programs or OT programs or whatever, you've dealt with it, uh, like event handlers, delegates, that kind of stuff that handle you know unbutton, press, etc. You can do the connections here, and that is using this guy, Edit Node Connections. So the timer two selected, just kind of click on it, and here are the events that it emits. The key one we want is timeout. Timeout is just like JavaScript says set timeout. Uh, timeout is the function that is called every time the timer ticks. Uh, so when it ticks, it calls timeout. So go ahead and set the connection for timeout and connect it. And we're connecting it to our parent node here, my rich text label. And you will see it automatically wants to name the method on underscore on underscore timer underscore two underscore timeout. I don't see anything problem with that, so we'll let that happen. And we'll go ahead and click connect. Uh, so now you'll see the, the script editor is automatically brought up, and we're back in our um, rich text labels script. So the script that is attached to, uh, go back to scene, the my rich text labels script, which I can click here to bring back in. Uh, sorry, 
there. My rich text label script is automatically having this method being called, which is going to be called by the timer every time there is a tick. So we're just going to change our code slightly. What we want to do is go ahead and add a counter. So basically show the elapsed seconds in, in addition to the hello world. And so every time a tick goes, we're going to update our counter. First, we need to add a member variable to our script here. So that's just a matter of var count equals zero. Uh, Godot is a duck type language, which means uh, it comes from the expression, looks like a duck, uh, acts like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Uh, they take the same approach with variables. If a variable looks like it's a float, it's a float. If it looks like it's a string, it's a string. Uh, so the initial appearance is what determines its type. Uh, in this case, it can infer the fact that it's an int by the fact that it's a zero. Or it could infer the fact that it's a float based off the fact that it's a float. So in this case, we're going to go ahead with our, our count. You can, you can convert variables after the fact. Don't worry about that. Uh, but now we'll go back down to our timer here. And each tick, let's increment our... Uh, counter. Coincidentally, there is no plus plus operator. Uh, next, we're going to clear out our text. So the uh, existing hello world message is taken away because uh, the only message, the only method available for adding text to a uh, rich text label is add text. So if you didn't do this, you will get the same, you will just basically keep appending it over and over and over again. So we don't want to do a clear there. And then finally, let's add our text self.add underscore text. Uh, now, next thing is we're going to use a, a built-in function. Again, if you go to the text-based version of this tutorial, I have a link to all of the built-in functions. Uh, but the one we're going to use now is called str, uh, str. And it's very comparable to um, string.format or uh, printf, depending on which language you come from. But it's a quick and easy way of formatting text or converting things to text. So what we want to do is we want to take our hello world message as one parameter into it. And say elapsed time colon and a space like so and then our second value into stir call is our count so this is going to make a new string out of uh, the first string and then the int value passed in and uh, finally close that off and enter now if i go ahead and run this code every second it ticks and updates And that's basically it. That this is a very uh, okay. This this is an annoying thing. It needs to go away. Uh, it's a very simple introduction, but it does show you the basics of creating an application, uh, manipulating nodes, uh, c editing connections between nodes, as well as scripting. Uh, in the next section will probably look like at graphics and get a little bit more in game specific. Uh, but that is a brief, gentle introduction to the Godot game engine. I hope it looks interesting to you, and you will stay tuned. Uh, thanks a lot. Goodbye.